And I want to bring in my next guest, 2024 Republican presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy. Great to see you again, Vivek. Thanks for being here. So is the judge right here? Was this the biggest attack against free speech in our entire history? The judge is absolutely right. And David, I was actually writing about this starting in January 2021, when along with my former Yale law professor, we were the first people to actually advance this legal theory. It was dismissed at the time where what we said was if the government actors are using private companies to do through the back door what the government could not do through the front door, then those private companies are actually bound by the First Amendment. That bucks conventional wisdom because the First Amendment usually applies to the government. But it turns out if they're turning private companies into their pawns to be able to censor speech that's protected by the First Amendment, then that's still bound by the Constitution as well. This is the first yeah. landmark case in which a federal judge has come down on the side of that legal theory that I advanced two years ago, over two and a half years ago, actually. And at that point, I think this is a major milestone for the protection of First Amendment freedoms of every American, because the most dangerous First Amendment threat is not even the one that comes directly from the government but one that comes from the government and is disguised to make you think that it was coming from a private well, company. Well, and Vivek, there are really two parts to the censorship story. There's a part of the administration, and, and it, they may be connected, but there's also the, what, what was called by Trump and others the deep state. I mean, you had the FBI in direct contact. We still don't know the extent to which the FBI might have been leaned on by the administration to do what they did uh, when they were talking to Twitter about censorship and stuff. So... It's it's not only the people in the White House. There is the problem of whether other agencies might be using social media. Absolutely. So, David, we have in this country what I call a waterfall of political accountability. The Constitution set it up such that Congress made the laws and the president, and the executive branch executed them. The waterfall step number one was to the alphabet soup of the administrative state, FTC, SEC, FBI and so on. What's happening then is they're delegating that to a new alphabet soup of FB, G-O-O-G, B-L-K, the A-M-N, A-M-Z-N, M-S-F-T, the new alphabet soup in the private sector. So this is what I call the woke industrial complex, a merger of private power and state administrative power that together is more powerful than what either could have accomplished on its own. And what I say, if, is, if it is state action in disguise, the Constitution still applies. Yeah. That's what this federal judge held. I think it is a landmark milestone for actually protecting the free speech rights of Americans across the country. And, you know, none of the people or or the organizations in that alphabet soup that you were talking about were elected. I mean, that's the point. These unelected officials right. are doing so much to control our lives in so many ways. I, I, I want to move on to to you because you've moved up to number three right under uh, Ron DeSantis in the in the list because there are a lot of Republicans running. Uh, what are you doing right and how do you get even higher. What we've been doing, David, is if you look at the metrics of the number of campaign events we've been doing, it blows the other candidates out of the water. So I'm using the same formula that's worked for me all my life in the business world and in, and in academics before then. Hard work pays off. So we're putting in the work. The other thing that I'm doing is just speaking honestly. My entire campaign strategy is I don't really listen to message consultants for my message. My job is to let the voters of this country know who I am and what I believe. Whether they vote for me or not is their decision. But if I know that I've let them know who I am and what I believe, then I can put my head at night on the pillow and go to sleep yeah. with peace. Well, you know, well, a lot of people, that forgive me for interrupting, debate, but a lot of people are wondering why uh, Ron DeSantis wasn't able to, to, to make more progress in going against Donald Trump. And one of the things that have been pointed out, he didn't just focus on the economy. He's been focusing on his fight with Disney and a lot of other stuff. But had he, because Americans are so concerned about the economy right now, and, and President Biden is very vulnerable on this, he's only 24 uh, percent say the economy is good to excellent. Seventy six percent say the economy is in fair or poor shape. And then uh, president, the president's direct approval on economy, it's actually up five points in the, in the past couple of weeks, but it's still only at a 38 percent approval, 60 percent disapproved. So, was that DeSantis's fault? And are you going to learn from that and focus more on the economy? 
Here's the lesson. This election will be won on who actually has a vision for where we are going as a country, not based on retrospective blame or boasting. It's going to be based on a vision for where we're going, and that includes economic growth. It's not just a discussion about tax cuts or tax increases versus spending cuts. It's also a question of how do we unlock GDP growth in this country itself? My vision is we unlock American energy, drill, frack, burn coal, embrace nuclear, put people back to work by no longer paying them to stay at home, reform the U.S. Federal Reserve, restore a single mandate for the U.S. Fed, and shut down that administrative regulatory state. Mm. That's a wet blanket on the U.S. economy. That's a vision where actually if our economy is growing, David. People tend to be more proud of a nation where they're making more money in that nation. So those are the kinds of issues okay. I'm focused on, not focused on the past, focused on what we are running to. Gotcha. And so far, that's been a successful strategy. The debate, in this stay right there. We want to hit another story with a reporter, but I want to get your reaction to it. Air travel being put to the test with nearly 50,000 flights expected to hit the skies today. This after a spectacular display of cancellations and delays over the July 4th holiday. Madison Allworth is live from Newark International Airport with more on this. Madison. Hey, David. Yeah, this is one of the airports that was hit the worst. And yet we still saw some of the strongest travel we've ever seen over this July 4th weekend. This all coming after tens of thousands of flights were canceled and delayed. Things moving smoother today. But the reality is many of those that had canceled flights still struggling to get out this morning. I met one traveler, Stephen. He was supposed to be in Columbus, Ohio yesterday. He was still at Newark Airport this morning. Take a listen. I first like, came from Bermuda, came to Newark, um, and then as soon as I landed, they just canceled my flights, had to wait in this line for over about well, over two hours, just so I could get rebooked until to come back again today, so I'm here now. I'm a little bit irritated. This is probably be my last time flying United. After United's meltdown last week, the company has confirmed to Fox Business that they will be reducing the number of flights out of Newark this summer. They were not specific about how many routes will be cut, but that is confirmed. The company also handed out 30,000 frequent flyer miles to travelers hit by those delays last week after travelers spent the evening in airports trying to get to their destination. Now, the demand for travel clearly very much still here. We set that travel record on Friday when 2.88 million passengers went through TSA checkpoints. That is the most we have ever seen in a single day. So while travelers are not only back, but actually setting records, the FAA, on the other hand, is struggling with staffing. Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg has acknowledged that more air traffic controllers are necessary, and the agency has plans to hire just over 3,000 over the next two years. But even with that, the agency is struggling with staffing, weekend coverage, and people calling out sick. Taking a look at today, we are currently seeing over 1,500 delays in the U.S. and over 100 cancellations. Cancellations. People that we've spoken to today outside of Stephen, they say they just they get to the airport early, try to hope for the best. But another thing that I've heard in terms of frustration is they're spending so much on their tickets and then there's no guarantee that their flight will take off on time, if at all. Uh. So there's a frustration there, but obviously a necessity when it comes to travel to get yeah. you where you need to go. Just not clear if that always happens in America today. Absolutely. David. Absolutely. Madison, thank you very much. Back with Vivek Ramaswamy now, the 2024 presidential candidate. So Vivek, how would you handle this? So look, the dirty little secret is part of what's causing this is a decision made in the Department of Transportation itself during the COVID-19 pandemic to delay training for people who could be air traffic controllers. That shortage is now coming due. So when Pete Buttigieg, the Secretary of Transportation, says that this is not the government's fault, do not believe him. It is absolutely the fault of failed COVID-19 policies that used COVID-19 as an excuse really for an epidemic of laziness across this country, especially in the federal government. And Unfortunately, yeah. everyday Americans are now having to pay for it. So I predict this is going to be here to stay as a problem in you air know, traffic control despite, for a while to come. Despite when these agencies don't deliver, I'm, I'm thinking of not only the FAA, but also Department of Education. We, we spent $200 billion on K-12 through and COVID relief, and this test scores just keep going down. When, when agencies don't deliver, is there a way to make the government we pay for accountable? 
The answer, David, is we need a president, and that's what I'm going to be, who is willing to shut those failing agencies down. I will shut down the U.S. Department of Education on strong constitutional authority. I have a clear plan to lay off over 75 percent of the federal employees. Usually, Republican presidents have been told that civil service protections for the federal bureaucrats would stop you from doing that. Turns out I've actually read the law. Civil service protections only apply to individual firings to protect against politicization. Mm. They do not apply to mass firings, and mass firings are exactly what I'm bringing to Washington, D.C. and my presidency. That would be a revolution. Vivek, thank you so much for being here. Great to see you. Stay safe on the campaign trail. Thanks very much. Still ahead.